Hello and uh, welcome to uh, our QA Financial Seminar. Uh, this is the second in our series on uh, the um, theme of 2021 vision. We're looking forward to key developments and technologies next year that will be affecting software quality assurance and the way it's implemented and managed by financial firms. And the theme of this session, uh, this seminar, is on change management and these you like to do technologies and the broader enterprise uh, view and management of, of change. And we have some, some great panellists today who I'm going to introduce very briefly in a minute. But first, uh, uh, um, let me tell you a little bit about the functionality of the site. To the top right of your screen, uh, you will see um, a live um, help button. If you need any support, we do have somebody there who can help you. Uh, one thing that is useful you to know is that you should be using Chrome to optimize um, uh, the use of this platform. So um, if you're not using Chrome, it might be an idea to switch. Um, there is a virtual exhibition hall and our series sponsor Broadcom has a stand there. If you go back to your timeline, you will see the virtual exhibition tab. You just click on that and you can visit that after um, the, the, um, the seminar, which will last one hour. Uh, we will be including some time at the end of this um, conversation for a few questions. Um, so if you have one, please do. You can see the live Q&A button on the right of your screen. If you have a question uh, at any time, please just uh, write it down, send it to us, and I'll, I'll see it, and I'll be able to put it to one or all of our panellists. So change management in the era of DevOps and automation. Um, we uh, have today, I'm looking um, at your screen uh, clockwise, uh, we have uh, um, Stephen Filoni from Broadcom. We have uh, Rich, Richard Jordan from uh, Nationwide Building Society. We have Anne Dean from JP Morgan and Sudeep Chatterjee from the London Stock Exchange Group. Um, and rather than um, uh, tell you a detail of uh, who they are and what they're doing, um, I'm going to ask each of them in turn as they first speak to, um, to tell a little bit more about their roles uh, and um, uh, what their uh, key tasks and objectives uh, for, for the coming year are at their funds. But we're going to cover a range of topics that we've discussed and um, I'm going to start with Rich uh, uh, Nationwide uh, because I know Rich that, that one of the key things, I mean Nationwide's been uh, I think we're in the, the midst of, of your digital transition uh, program. But I know that one of the key things that you're going to be looking at over the next 12 months is value stream management. Um, yep. And well, uh, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about what you hope uh, to achieve from that. Cool. Yeah, so just to introduce myself very quickly. So I'm Rich Jordan. Um, I'm a test engineering manager at Nationwide Build Society. Um, so as, as the name suggests, I work predominantly in the testing space and testing QA. Um, the, my, my role, um, I guess, uh, I, I manage or lead uh, what, what you might deem as a, a technical testing capability within a uh, centralized test capability, a test engineering capability within Nationwide. Um, I also have delivery responsibilities for test um, of a number of portfolios as well. So things like uh, middleware, things like platform, um, a couple of portfolios in terms of delivery. Um, in terms of the question, um, Nationwide has been on a bit of a journey um, over probably the past uh, four or five years. And uh, in test specifically, uh, we've been kind of exploring uh, continuous testing and continuous testing capabilities in conjunction with the broad nationwide um, aspiration, transformational journey, whatever you want to call it, around adopting um, agile ways of working and uh, DevOps practices. And um, so from a, a kind of a transformation point of view, we moved from what we historically called ourselves as a development center We've moved to a squad model. Um, now what we're doing in, in terms of looking at value streams is we're, we're moving to a model called uh, a mission model, okay? Um, and really the reason for doing that is to uh, really focus ourselves around um, business priorities and business needs. So, so really to draw a parallel on where we were with the squads, uh, we kind of had uh, 2021 squads historically uh, that were working centered around uh, technologies, okay? 
And um, it wasn't always clear when we were working in terms of uh, delivering uh, capabilities into squads, uh, what the actual business focus was, okay? What the priority was of the business. You know, arguably we had 20 priorities and, you know, to try and juggle 20 priorities is just too much. And so where we're going now, what Nationwide is doing is moving towards a mission uh, model where uh, fundamentally we have three missions within Nationwide. We have uh, hopes and dreams, uh, 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 everyday money and um, uh, moments that matter. Now, as a build society, um, you can kind of read through the kind of the potentially corny names of those missions into actually it's about protecting people's money, protecting people's uh, homes and you know, mortgages and, and making money accessible to people when it matters. And um, I think what's quite interesting about that is, is, is actually everybody in the organization has as, as kind of a direction of travel uh, delivering to those three missions or those three value streams, if you like. Um, and I think a really great example of how kind of that has really uh, paid dividends, uh, even in uh, recent times, is uh, we've, we've got a quite a well-publicized story around um, uh, mortgage uh, mortgage holidays because of COVID, okay? So um, as you might imagine, um, many people in the UK um, were furloughed during uh, the kind of the first lockdown in the UK. And as, as, as such, uh, many financial organizations who provide mortgages were incentivized to provide mortgage holidays. And the mission construct allowed us to really be focused on kind of the member outcomes, member customer to us, and really um, focus multi-directional teams in terms of delivering that customer focus, the customer outcome, um, far greater uh, time efficiency and quality than we historically have ever done. And it kind of, uh, as, as we kind of evolve that model and we evolve uh, kind of our mission construct, what we start to do is we're starting to look at kind of um, historical ways in which the organization have grown, if you like, is a bit like Conway's law in that kind of our, our VC model and our squad model, if you like, has evolved and it's, 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 it's kind of manifested the architecture we have today. Uh, we need to learn and understand going forward how to undo some of that to really, um, uh, amalgamate with and complement the missions that we know we want to, to deliver in the future. And and value stream management, how does that how does that fit into this picture? Um, that that's a specific platform, isn't it? That's a specific way of at, attributing value to changes you make in your development process and spreading best practice across across the enterprise, isn't it? So you it can is, link yeah. to these customer outcomes that you talked about. Oh, absolutely, yes, and 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 we we're, we're on our journey to understand, you know, from an from an abstract level, uh, we have mm. these these missions, if you like, but those missions will have many uh, value streams within them, and part of the kind of the the rearchitecture, rearchaeology, if you like, of what our nest systems do, and 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 also what the business needs in terms of value, it's 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 about um, creating. Um, those value streams to, to give much uh, more focus and vision around what we're actually trying to deliver. Okay. And is that single tool or platform that you're going to be buying? So, 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 so we've looked at a couple of the tools on the market at the moment, um, but um, we haven't actually chosen a tool at this point in time. And I don't know that we ever will. I think we've, we've come to the conclusion that actually um, it's our job to understand what our value streams are and only uh, uh, we can do that. Will a tool be an enabler to us in the future? Possibly, but I think we've got to take a bit more ownership of it in the first place rather than kind of diverting to a tool straight away. Okay, good. Um, and, and finally, um, uh, uh, so I, I guess what was summary that, that in, you've, uh, you've known if, um, if what you were, you know, broadly that you were getting the, the return on investment that you wanted, if you, if you were, if you were um, um, delivering uh, apps uh, on schedule or faster, uh, with fewer with fewer faults, with fewer bugs, but now you want something that goes a little bit deeper. Uh, over the next twelve months, you're going to be looking to connect um, the changes that you've made uh, uh, much more clearly to these customer outcomes. Is that is that does that sum it up correctly? Absolutely, yeah, and, and I think just to draw a parallel or, or, or draw it back to kind of my my space in terms of, of continuous testing, um, I think the, the kind of the value stream concept and what we do in, in Nationwide is probably a nod to, to Steve from Broadcom is, is the whole modeling uh, concept that we're starting to adopt. And it, it's very complementary in terms of um, 
that re-archaeology re exercise and um, uh, visualizing value streams that, that we want and we desire within the organization. Great. Well, thank, well, thanks, Rich. And, and Nadine, if I can turn to you, if you could tell us a little bit again about uh, your role at JP Morgan and, and, and also, you know, what your, what your current priorities are. We're also looking forward, I think, um, you know, again, um, you know, uh, connecting um, uh, the enterprise, the corporate change strategy to, to uh, testing and software quality assurance is a, is, is a key theme for you, I'm sure. But also, I know that um, um, you know you, you. One of your your key challenges and the challenges, of, I'm sure, many many of, of the people um, uh, joining us today online is is how uh, AI and machine learning technologies are going to be applied to software development and how the potential is going to be realised. All right. Um, hi everyone. I actually uh, resonated, or well, Rick was presenting resonated with me his role. Uh, my role is similar. I come from software engineering. I'm still a software engineer, and I choose to think that I'm a software engineer that specializes in the quality space. Um, I run the software testing platform for JP Morgan. Um, it started in one of the line of businesses of JP, and um, it effectively resonated across the other lines of businesses because the problems are quite similar everywhere, regardless of the differences in the businesses that we conduct. And uh, the strategy, the architecture was accepted as the firm wide and effectively, you know, my team was reworked and um, I've got a bigger remit to architect, design and deliver solutions for the quality of space in JP Morgan. Um, to answer, I guess I'll start from the back to talk about AI and machine learning. Um, also something that you guys discussed before, um, also resonated with me where we need to connect the changes that we are making the software to the customer outcomes. Um, effectively, machine learning comes to the, from that angle as well. Um, we have a problem with scale. I'm sure many people do. Uh, we are 240,000 people firm, roughly. Uh, we are 40,000 technologists firm. We build our build. We have a, a um, uh, centralized CI/CD system to build roughly 100,000 builds a day. So it's um, you know, maybe it's not a stunning volume, but it's a volume quite considered to to worry about. Um, effectively driven by the speed, the need of speed, driven by the need of move fast but safely. Um, also being highly regulated institution, my one of the biggest challenges is to be able to test smartly, choose where you basically test because the brute force testing is not sustainable um, anymore given the volumes and the speed. Um, and so it's a testing smart and uh, evidence in our testing and um, assessing the risk of the changes we are making. Yeah. The AI comes in from a slightly different angle. Sorry. Sorry. Someone has to go on mute. Okay. Um, I think okay. we're fine. Cool. Um, so it's slightly different angle than the one I've seen so far on the street, I mean, on, on the industry, where AI is more used to attempt to generate test cases and mimic users' behaviors or predict users' behaviors. Um, we come from a different angle where we use UI, I'm sorry, um, ML to learn the testing patterns and attempt to predict the chance of a failure while the changes are being made. So literally someone is coding a change in the IDE and um, well, literally there is a pop-up that says, hey, N, you are in the code and in, in, in the file that has been changed by 10 developers for the past 30 days um, and caused 80% of uh, build failures. Given your personal history in this code base, given the history of the code base, we predict that there is a chance of 75% of you introducing an error. So, and then obviously we don't want you to stop coding we immediately generate the advices. What is it that you would like 
to do. You would either need to refactor or you would need to talk to uh, Jasmine and ask her to review your code because she's an SME in this code space or you need to apply some design patterns um, to your code, or you need to cover it with more tests, something like that, something intelligent. So that's pretty much what ML comes in and so forth. We have a bunch of hypotheses that we put forward with, with the intent to predict and potentially avoid the chance of introducing care. So that, that, that's really fascinating. I mean, can, can you give us some idea of, I mean, where are you now on that curve of, of uh, AI adoption? in software quality assurance and development and, and where where do you think you can get here's time is there a way of um you, you can you can you can tell us yeah um today we've already it's our almost second year into this um today we have a ubiquitous uh test analytics platform integrated into all the components of CICD that collects the results of the test runs, any test runs um, that uh, are performed within our CI CD, meaning we don't consider manual testing, but we consider automated testing, any type of testing. Just want to preclude the questions. We are not sonar. <laughs> we are not assessing the code coverage. We are not the code coverage tool. Uh, rather, we collect the results of tests, trying to link the changes that were made um, trying to link them to the um, uh, requests that we use Jira for, for issue tracking, so the Jira effectively Jira issue tracks tra issues, and uh, also connecting them to the um, errors that we find, failures that we find in the code. So just to 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 identify the fragile spots in the code. So we have that collection. Obviously, we need to train our machine learning model. So we need to have a lot of data, which we do, not a problem. Um, and today we already have a very tiny hypothesis implemented and working pretty well. And the very first hypothesis says that um, majority of tests in any test stack, in any testing type, never fail. Hence, why would we want to run all the time on every single change? We would want to run them as a part of regression, but not every single time we make a change. Um, so we added that feature in the CICD, which allows us to skip, as we call them, evergreen tests and run only fragile, uh, high value tests. Because frankly, we believe that if the test passes, it has little value. It doesn't mean we don't have problems. It just means that the test doesn't find a problem. Yeah. And if the test fails, it will indicate the problem. So um, I, actually, I actually have a question for, for you on that. Yeah. Um, so I see, I see what you're saying about if a test always passes, why run it all the time? You're, it's a waste of time. Run it, like you said, in regression, run it every once in a while, but why run it all the time? But then the question is, is if a test is always failing, because we all have tests that we, we, we see, it runs, it fails, and we ignore it because we haven't fixed it, we haven't gone through that code yet, we haven't changed the code yet. So I would say, you probably shouldn't run those either. <laughs> Unless you know that a change has been made either to the test itself or to the code that the test is hitting, why waste your time running those tests? Because now you're just going to get false positives or actual, I guess they're not false, but they're positives that you are refusing to fix. So why keep running through those until you need to? Steven, right? Thanks for the yeah. question. It's an awesome question. One of my favorite ones. All my questions are awesome. Just kidding. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just mentioned before that um, we have a problem of volumes. In this case, we also have a problem of volume in test testbacks written by QA engineers who are pretty much removed from the daily development and they have vague understanding of what the software does. Mm -hmm. They have tens or or quite a few applications that need to worry about. So effectively, we ended up having, uh, accumulating very voluminous test packs. And the question in my mind is, what do we do with them? To start from scratch, um, <laughs> that's not going to work in our space. Hence, we need to get some use of the test packs that we have. So immediately rule out the evergreens because they are low cost and drive attention to the tests that fail. 
they can be fragile, meaning they can fail because of the environments. And here you go, you have a, a different kind of worms to open to do with the environment setup. You have fragile, oh, sort of always failing tests that, that pretty much the functionality has changed, underlying functionality has changed. Obviously, our goal is to raise the flag, get developers to attend to them. Either retire, rewrite, I guess do something, but please do not carry the baggage that you've accumulated for 10 years to the new platform. That hope that makes sense. Yeah. I, I want people to, to get alerted. I want people to attend to them. Yeah, yeah. So instead of ignoring them, like when I was uh, a developer, I used to ignore warnings in my builds. Uh, so instead of ignoring them, you force the developers or testers, whoever, someone to take action, either remove that test from your test suite or fix the test or fix the code. Yes, mm -hmm. because every failing test, to your point, is run actually anywhere between three to 10 times slower than the, the passing test. So on top of everything, it also adds on to the time and it adds, adds uh, wastes the compute power. Correct. Just on top of it. Yeah. The other thing that, that, that you brought up, and, and thank you for going into so much detail, um, but the other thing you brought up is the broad issue of the enterprise view of IT risk um, and how you benchmark IT risk, uh, and, and in particular software risk, um, in, in, in the context of um, you know, uh, uh, this enterprise view uh, and enterprise-wide change. You know, how yeah. you attribute those different types of risk. Um, and that's fascinating, yeah. and particularly, of course, there is a, there's a compliance regulatory dimension to this question, which is, you know, the, the increasing scrutiny regulators might have or might take in regard to software development over the over the next year at financial firms, because we've seen some very high profile uh, issues, um, data breaches, of course, but also the impact of, um, like, like you know, most recently, the, um, the, the, the software problems at the Tokyo Stock Exchange or the Australian Stock Exchange. So. Regulators are going to be looking much more closely, we can assume, uh, and be perhaps uh, increasingly prescriptive of the way in which they want large financial to test and to, 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 to ensure the quality of their software. Where are you in terms of, again, on the curve of, of this enterprise view? What is your capability? You know, I think we are not that, not in a bad position here. Again, given that we're so regulated, it's mind boggling. Um, it was a big change that we introduced last year, which to me was a vital, um, absolutely vital change, where we modified our risk and control toll gates, if you will, well, the truly toll gates, to start assess the risk of a change that we are releasing rather than of the entire software that we are releasing every time. And that shifted the focus to testing, evaluating, assessing, security testing, performance testing, and different types of testing on the actual changes we make within a given release. The reason for that is that we acknowledge that today, whatever's in production is in production, meaning if you have a high risk application in production, we deal with it today. The goal is not to add on, not to make the things worse, by having high and keeping high standards to the changes that we release in hopes that once you really, you can't, you can't improve the change in isolation. By touching one piece of code, you effectively need to improve the other piece of code. So gradually, by focusing on the quality of the change, you will improve the overall standing of the entire code base. Okay. Um, Okay. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Maybe maybe we can come back to that. I mean, this is the challenge of increasing complexity of the, that all financial firms um, face as you know we become more dependent on on the cloud. And you mentioned, and you know, uh, we want to exploit the opportunities uh, that that our, um, AI and machine learning present. That complexity requires requires um, you know, new methods. Um, Stephen, you were, you were speaking a minute ago that we, we, we haven't um, had you introduce yourself properly. Perhaps you could do that and tell us a little bit about I mean, your role at Broadcom and whether we, we've heard from now from Anne and from Rich uh, nationwide, um, how typical are their priorities um, compared to you know, um, other financial firms you're dealing with? 
Sure. So, hi, I'm Steve Filoni. I am head of products for our continuous testing software uh, at Broadcom. So I've been in the testing space for over 20 years. I started at a company called Mercury Interactive and I've stayed with testing throughout. So how common are the problems? It's, it's interesting. Uh, since I've been in the space for 20 some odd years, I, I've seen an evolution of how companies have gone through their quality and, and uh, uh, assessment and their their maturity with quality over time. Obviously, when I started out, we were pitching centers of excellence and these this core center of excellence, which now once you go to agile, that becomes a, a massive bottleneck. And so we've seen that change. Now, then people start to focus on the individual components, individual features that they're changing that we were just talking about. Once they get a better handle on how to do that type of testing, then it comes down to, as as, as Rich was saying, it, it, it comes down to, okay, now, now that we're able to do this, why are we doing this, right? We're not testing just to test software, just push things out the door. Everything we do is for the business. Now, how do we track everything that we're doing? Yes, we're able to track uptime in production. We're able to track whether it's good performance in production, but are we getting the business value that we expected from what we wrote, from what we tested? And now that is the key, and I'm hearing this over and over again. And financial firms, um, I guess it's not surprisingly anymore, but 10 years ago, financial firms embraced agile faster than most other enterprises. Financial companies started delivering software faster than most other enterprises. Even though highly regulated, I would have thought financial firms would have been in the back. But I guess there's so many pressures, so much competition, the mobile apps, there's this constant change. Um, so I see it a lot in the financial, financial firms. And where I'm getting asked over and over again, how do I tie this back to the business to make sure the business is getting the value that they expect? from the releases and to make sure that when we are testing, we are testing the right things for the business value. I have limited time to get testing done. Whether I'm testing in the Agile team, whether the developer's doing the testing, whether a center of excellence is doing the testing, user acceptance testing, testing in production, wherever I am doing my testing in a continuous way, I want to make sure that I'm always focusing on the value that the business is trying to achieve and not just testing for testing's sake. Yeah. And I know, Stephen, you also wanted to talk about the, um, the critical role of data management over the coming year. And we, we, all, we all know how important it is, particularly in the context of uh, in the implementation of AI technologies. But I know you, you have very strong views about how uh, the requirements of better data management, more effective data management, are actually going to change the way everything's organized. Well, yeah. So uh, test data management uh, has always been a challenge. I, I don't think anyone would argue that. What I have found, and actually over the last year, probably a little less than a year, is the demands for test data and changes in test data has greatly increased. Now I attribute that to, uh, again, the evolution that's going on, where first you have the development teams doing agile work, shrinking down the feature sets to deliver, but now there's a, a, obviously a higher demand for the agile teams to test more. Don't just test one positive flow and say, yeah, it's done. But now you want to properly test that component, that service, whatever they're developing, and one of the biggest complaints, say, I've heard for the last three or four years is they don't have the data they need. And they're not going to spend the time to figure out the data that they need. And then how do you make sure that the data they get is properly masked and secured so you don't have security violations? And so we're hearing a lot more. And I'm hearing this from analysts. I'm hearing this from customers. It's across the board where... These companies are struggling on how to get the right data to the right teams at the right time. 
when it was, again, everyone was focused on a COE, a center of excellence, then what they were doing is every so often, once a week, once a month, once a year, they were grabbing these massive snapshots from production, going through the masking process, then bringing a gold copy, and then that's what they'd use. And every tester would use that same thing. They would either copy it off or do something else. But now, with the massive shift of, of Agile, and let's just extend that to the value stream management that uh, that we were talking about earlier. Once you have this whole process, now you need data, the right data, maybe it's synthetic data for the developers because they don't need everything. And then once you get to your full end-to-end -end testing, now I need a whole different set of data where I have to understand all the complexities what happened in production so I can test that properly on an end-to-end -end or in a stage environment. And now once I go into production, now I have synthetic tests or virtual users that are running tests in production. I need a set of data to run there. That's not going to hurt my system or do anything bad into the database. So I need different types of data at different stages of my cycle. And I need to have it instantaneously because I don't have time to wait anymore. I can't just ask my test data management group or my DBA group, can I get this data? I have to have it when I need to test. And we're seeing that come on strong. And the, of course, more and more about PII information, we can't let it out. Some companies feel that they can only use production data, but then security teams say, I don't even care if you mask that data, you can't touch that production data, there's too much risk in that. And so synthetic data is on the rise. So we're seeing a lot of that going on right now. Okay. And there was something else I wanted to ask you about, Stephen. Um, which is, uh, we, we all agree that, that, that DevOps is, let's, well, let's all agree that DevOps is a good thing and it's necessary uh, to move further down the road to continuous app delivery, which um, is everybody's objective. Mm -hmm. But it does present some organizational challenges to financial firms, again, because of the high regulated environments in which they work. Um, and uh, because of the sensitivity uh, the market sensitivity and the business sensitivity of their apps. It's not like uh, Spotify or Netflix where something can go wrong and get things really quickly. It, it might have much, much uh, more serious consequences than that. So release management, um, um, how do you see in the DevOps um, world release management um, managed by, by financial firms in these environments? Well, it's interesting. Um... When it comes to release management, there, there's a, a few, a few things. One, there are certain financial firms that I talk to that say that they are highly regulated and therefore like development teams cannot push to production. Only the operations guys who have the authority are allowed to push into production. Okay, that's fine. But then what happens is even if you're in a very highly regulated, but you want to push out once a day or once a week, it, it becomes a, a very quick process. So you're ready to go, you've analyzed it, you actually get a score, you show in some way, shape or form that the release is ready. You can't wait now for, okay, I'm ready to go, let's set up a meeting, let's all have a kumbaya, let's have a discussion, what is the QA people done? What have the developers done? Did we get the right uh, work items in there? Okay, have we done our, all of our security tests? The security guys sign off. Like you don't have that time anymore. When you were doing every six months, sure. But release management is now more of the is built into the entire process. So the the testing's done. The testing shows you automatically what the coverage is. They show you what we have tested. Here are the work items. Here's the security. A, a score comes up that tells you here's what your risk level is on your release. And now that ops person can just hit a button and say, okay, based on everything I've just seen, I don't have to have meetings, I hit a button and I can release. Now, there are some financial firms, and I can never figure out why certain financial firms are able to do this and others aren't. It's a world of governance and regulation that is beyond my comprehension. I have other financial firms, fintechs, that don't have this problem, that the development group, are they're able to push to production at any time. And as long as they can show an audit trail of what they've done and what they tested, then people can go back in time and audit to make sure that they are following the rules, but they're able to push out instantaneously. And again, 
You can use the exact same process to do that. You just take away that governance step. And so now say that scoring mechanism I talked about is no longer just uh, informational for a governance person to say yes or no. That scoring becomes the, uh, the intelligence to decide, am I going to release now? Or if I am going to release now, how do I release? Do I change my canary deployments? Do I have a blue green deployment? Do I do things differently based on the score or do I not release? And that's automatically done in the background. And so this is what I've been seeing uh, in the more, more advanced uh, financials. Well, it would be really interesting to hear from our next speaker, Sudhir Chatterjee from the London Stock Exchange, what, what his view about that is, because of course, exchanges are perhaps the best example of the most complex um, development challenges because of the interconnectedness of their client bases and the technologies that they're using. Uh, and of course, we have seen recently, I mentioned the, 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 the issues that the Tokyo Stock Exchange and the Australian Stock Exchange have faced, the, the challenge of complexity fundamentally. So I'd be very interested to hear, Sudeep, what you have to say about that. Um, but also, um, of course, um, we're, we're talking today about the interface between software development and quality assurance and the sort of broader um, enterprise strategic objective of change management. And of course, um, uh, Run Stock Exchange and Refinitiv, your um, acquisition of Refinitiv, uh, proposed acquisition of Refinitiv, is going to be, I assume, taking up um, a lot of your time over the coming year. So, uh, quite a lot to ask you about, Sudi. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about yourself first. Thank you so much, Matthew. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sudeep Chatterjee. I head up the testing division for London Stock Exchange. Um, and, and, and yeah, so you're yeah, right. I think the the challenges around the you know and the complexity in London Stock Exchange absolutely is kind of uh, it, it kind of it's many folds. Like we, we always talk about things like you know a, a, a production in incident uh, for us is BBC News. So or or CNN news, so that's 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 the challenge we we go with. That's that's what I was told when I joined as well. That you know, um, and it, and it's true. Uh, you know, we've seen that um, London Stock Exchange themselves had their fair share of challenge um, in 2019. Uh, there've been issues in other exchanges this year, um, and of course, you know, uh, we would not never want to kind of be that position, uh, me for one, would not want to be. Um, I know how stressful it becomes when uh, when you're trying to solve a production issue will reporters in, in front of the building trying to solve uh, and ask questions about that. But anyway, so how do we solve that? I think the value piece is important. Um, now, but thing remember, especially now coming and working in Stock Exchange Group now is value isn't always about the functional value. Uh, I think in, in a lot of times, um, in my experience, and good to hear from others, is essentially the the functional value becomes an implicit point when we talk about business value. Uh, now how does it look? Does it kind of does it what it says on the tin? Which is always important, absolutely. But how much time do we talk about the resiliency value with our business? How much time do we talk about that? How uh, the the investment the businesses want to have around our, um, you know, DR cap capacity and capabilities, not just because it's regulated, but because they actually want it to be and understand the requirement for it. How much time they would want to spend the time to do the testing on it. How much time the business actually runs their actual trading or day activities from a secondary data center, or is it just something that happens once a weekend annually because it's it's a MIFID regulation requirement. Um, and I think those are the things that I, I, I understand that organizations are now starting to think about, right? Like the, the, the value management part, the piece about that Anne talks about, about machine learning, understanding and trying to preempt where the issues could be. Uh, you know, test more, test often, absolutely we've heard of that, but also test smarter, look at areas that needs to be tested, you know, be, you know, we, we make, certain reviews around, you know, you know, if it's ever green test that needs to be skipped or tests that, you know, haven't really been checked and, you know, and, 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 and we need to skip those. But in the end, uh, as a team own the quality, team own the process around how to check for things that can go wrong, have that view that everyone from, you know, the person working in an agile team to the program manager, director, MD, everyone trying to think, okay, we are starting to build this change, which is going to go 
and hit production. What are the things that can go wrong? Everyone keep thinking about it. Everyone being a risk manager. And that, that's the only way I, I've, I've found that the best way to kind of solve this problem. Data absolutely is part of that puzzle itself. And, and um, that's, that's really fascinating. I mean, but is um, automation and the, the, the opportunity in, in AI machine learning, is that um, the answer to some of these challenges that, that clearly uh, financial firms and the most complex financial firms um, and venues, trading venues, have with uh, functional testing? It's still a challenge. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. sorry. No, no, absolutely. Look, we can't, we can't solve this problem uh, by not embracing um, automation or embracing AI or machine learning. You know, uh, for example, when we test our algos, uh, we have to apply a certain level of AI ML logic to it. So it's it's been there. It's, we've been doing that. Um, and, and you're right. I think the, the, the thing is, is that it's not just one... Uh, I guess silver bullet. If I say that, um, you know, it's it's going. It has to be a co combination, an enterprise view of the risk. Uh, you know, looking at uh, what are the things that takes most time, reduce the cycle time for our business, understand uh, how uh, organization has been set up, understand and getting HR involved or on the people side. I'm a big f fan of that. You know, it's not just about the technology, it is not just about the process, it's people process technology. So let's not forget the people part to it. So things like that, you know, the location strategy, you know, how are they connected with the business? If someone is in a, in a, in a, in a location where the business isn't really uh, available on a, on a, on a day to day basis, how does that communication work? Does it work on a sort of a master servant relationship? Or is it actually a partnership with your, your vendors? All that kind of comes in. Yeah. Uh question for you. When, when yeah. you're talking about the resiliency, obviously it, there's so many pieces involved with that. There's the, the hardware resiliency, there's the failover, there's the configurations. Um, where do you find your biggest challenges? And, and that's in twofold. Where do you find the most issues with resiliency and what parts are the hardest to test for? Yeah, good question. So it's it's the, the first of all, I think initially it was the acceptance that we have to invest in this aspect. Now, of course, you know, with 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 any sort of big issue that happens in production, with you know regulators looking at it, it kind of gives a trigger anyway. Um, and then it is essentially allowing time for the people who understand the platforms understand the business to come together and start to think, okay, what are the areas that we will need to look at? You know, you're right. It is, it is, it is, um, it is an engineering on its own, right? It's, you know, uh, you know, and of course, you know, the chaos engineering is quite, quite popular. Netflix made very popular, uh, you know, with, with, with the, the work that they do with chaos monkey and all that people are aware of this, but when we are starting to look at, uh, resiliency, uh, we are looking at things from an, of course, from an infrastructure perspective, a network perspective, application perspective. Um, so it, it starts from the very, very, from the seed of the requirement coming into the change and say, okay, so if if, if you're building a certain component and um, to an application, you know, what are the areas that it might go wrong on? And then if it does, what is going to be the, how would the other parts of the system will actually behave uh, if it fails? So it's kind of that culture of thinking that you know, what if this happens? What will how will the other things do? That's one. The second thing is bringing our operational support into it. I think one thing I realized is that you know, and I've done in other organizations, but in some of the organizations I worked is that the operational support people uh, aren't really in the agile teams, aren't really refining the requirements, and and that goes for both technology operations and business operations. Uh, maybe your frontline uh, business, who are maybe the traders and the and the and the team representing them, may be part of the requirements. Again, going back to that point about functional business value and non-functional business value. So things like that. So we'll have to kind of, as a culture of the organization, has to think resiliency. Then only it comes through. And today, um, we have been on a different topic. We have been hearing more and more over the past couple of years about the challenge of managing IT risk uh, in mergers and acquisitions. Um, and yes. Uh, uh, you've got this, this, this as I say, uh, proposed acquisition of the definitive. That's going to yeah. you know, how you're spending your time over the coming year. 
No, no, absolutely. I think, you know, resiliency has fascinating it is. It is for us now, uh, unfortunately, quick getting into a bit of a BAU mode now with the big work on um, the Refinitiv coming through. And it's just not on um, Refinitiv because people are aware and reading the news as part of the buy of Refinitiv. There's a separation piece with Borsa as well, who's been a uh, part part of LSCG for many years. So, you know, it's it's, it's close collaborations. You know, everything is kind of we have teams working in with Borsa. Obviously, we have got systems that are interconnected, etc. So totally, and and we have all seen and heard of big mergers, and particularly in the technology side, uh, not going so well. Um, it will need a lot of planning, of course. It will need a lot of uh, work uh, around that i think one thing that is good is um you know with this resiliency mindset i think everyone from top down understands that you know if you, if you take every step that has to be completely thought through you know there is no haste and you know quick quick answers to anything uh, and good thing from a test leadership perspective is that you know it helps to kind of build that uh, budgeting discussions when it comes to a funding from from a testing perspective. So that that's good. I guess one good thing for me. Good. Uh, now I am going to leave some time for questions. So if anybody watching and listening right now has a question, because we covered quite a few different topics, and very interested to hear contributions as well, not just questions. But if you have something you'd like to say or ask, uh, please uh, click the live Q and A button you can see to your right of your screen, and I will see your questions. I'll be able to put them to our panelists. Let's go back to, to, to Rich, Richard, Richard Jordan at um, Nationwide, because I'd like to ask everybody about the impact of COVID. Um, again, uh, a lot of firms are talking about lessons learned and how those lessons will be carried through um, into the coming year. Lessons about the way we work, about security, for example. And, you know, in the context of change management, uh, and I mean, Rich, for example, um, has COVID stretched everything out and what are the changes I mean, in terms of timelines and what other changes do you think it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to prompt in the way that you work at Nationwide over the, over the coming year? So, so I think COVID has probably accelerated a lot of our ways of working. I, I mentioned that we've kind of been on a transformation journey for a few years now and kind of missions are the kind of the, the latest incarnation to kind of, kind of consolidate. But before that, we've kind of been experiencing and I mentioned things like continuous testing and things like that. And a lot of a lot of what underpins um, our continuous testing strategy um, is modeling. OK, so visualization and we, we follow an, an approach. Uh, 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 we call it visual BDD. And um, it's not about the act of doing the modeling, but probably uh, touching on kind of what Sadiq said, I think as well, in that what we're actually trying to elicit out of kind of our three amigo stakeholder meetings, and we were doing this before COVID, is, is actually what does quality mean? Yeah, not just from a functional perspective, but what are the different facets when it comes to you know, functional, when it comes to resilience? What, is that, what do we actually care when we put something live? And actually, when we iterate around something, what do we, what do we maintain and care about? And I think from a, uh, you know, we're all in isolation now, uh, but what we've done through our modeling and the kind of the analysis and the capturing of analysis to have a living specification, we have a visual representation of something to, to, to talk around. And therefore, although we are physically isolated, we've kind of got a virtual co-location and the thing that we talk around becomes this visual aid, this, this living specification, so there's a common understanding and a common conversation in what we are doing. Um, I think we kind of got lucky in that from a technology perspective, kind of it was already there. What we started to do in terms of our approach around this visual BD approach and, you know, kind of bringing in people towards that, again, it's focused and it's brought clarity around the need uh, to follow this way of working. Um, and, uh, you know, this isolation thing, it, it, you know, in, in hindsight, it, 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 it's an, an opportunity that we have taken to, 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 to further the advancement of actually, you know, historically, we've probably done a bit too much quality analysis in the testing phase. Actually, we need to push the quality and, and, guys and, uh, right the way back to actually understand what quality Morgan, I put the same we very general it. question to you. Um, let's learn from this very difficult challenging year. It was uh, difficult personally for many of people I work with across the globe. Um, in terms of the uh, impact, I would yeah, I would definitely agree that it accelerated many things. 
um, yes, those things that we procrastinated on became more important all of a sudden. I think the productivity overall also increased. Um, definitely our meetings became much more sustainable and much more meaningful, I would say, with meaningful outcomes. Um, yeah, if anything, we started moving faster, as, as odd as it sounds. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and just uh, before we, we, we move on uh, to, to Stephen Brisbane comments on that, we had uh, one question from um, somebody um, watching today uh, asking about the cloud and rates of um, um, uh, public and private cloud adoption at financial firms still uh, lagging other industries. Uh, what did the panel think about the uh, the potential for, for acceleration of cloud adoption? Um, of course, this is no, um, I don't think that's a reflection on the, the extent to which, you know, the, the, the firms that you represent are uh, have, uh, have moved to the cloud. But Stephen, uh, it's a good one for you to comment on, perhaps. What, what are you seeing? Um, um, I mean, regulators have given was university the green back to cloud but some some from even even some of the largest financial firms slow slow to to transition yeah so this is one of the areas so i, I was saying the financial firms really embraced agile and delivery faster but when when it comes to going to to SaaS and public cloud um yeah. i do definitely have seen the financial firms lag behind um there's there's so much concern of PII information getting out, so much concern about the security and keeping the uh, their assets um, under control. So, but there's definitely a move. It is happening, and it's in twofold. It's it's uh, I, I see it happening with the the say the say the testing assets, the tools you use. I see that more and more going as a SaaS offering instead of being on prem. I see that going more SaaS, it is still a challenge security and otherwise and keeping the data secure and all that but i do see that moving but when it comes to pushing out the the software and the services clearly i've seen that uh accelerate a lot faster where the services are being pushed out and being able to be maintained in uh either public clouds or virtual public clouds where it's no longer your own data center you now get machines but you're able to put that in a secured environment whether it's in aws or azure so I, i've definitely seen it happening and it's happening faster over the last say two years but clearly the financial industry has been slower at least in my point of view slower to adopt both from the tool set as well as the the uh uh putting their own services and things into the public uh cloud but I, I think a lot of those security concerns have been addressed and are being addressed. So I do see that now accelerating where I do see more and more financial firms putting out their services and, and others. In fact, um, I won't say the company, but it was interesting what they're doing. They're taking their services and even when they're not even fully available for the customer yet, they're still pushing out these services into a public cloud offering so that the rest of the firm and their third parties can start to use it and develop on it. And then once it's ready, all they do is flip a switch to allow other people to have access to it through the other services and other software. So I, I do see, and these are, are fintechs that I'm talking about, but um, I, I do see that happening as well. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. Sudhi, uh, the, 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 perhaps we can return to this, this question also. The, um, COVID and the impact on um, the way your teams work and whether the lasting changes, lasting lessons that, that you've learned from um, a difficult year, but, but one in which, you know, um, we've had the opportunity to think about um, uh, doing things very differently. Yeah, no, no, exactly. It's, it's, it's been a very challenging year, right? I think it's that's true with everyone. Um, but there have been lessons learned, I think, um, one thing is definitely allow you know uh, letting people work at their own time but and we have seen the productivity gone up because of that i think that appreciation has come through um so it's no different uh, i think um, you know when hopefully things get back to normal very soon and we're back to normal or uh, whatever that looks like i think this these learnings will come through i think it, one thing i will say is that uh, because uh, it, it's a strange phenomenon about you know everyone in the globe kind of getting impacted around the same time, 
it's did bring the team together. I feel um, you know everyone's starting to appreciate a bit more about you know people's sort of personal space and how everyone is trying to work around that. So that's definitely helped. Like we didn't really need a lot of team building sort of specific sessions because of this. Uh, every day is a team building because everyone is trying. Everyone is trying to cope with the pandemic and the family and the work at the same time. So yeah, uh, it's definitely got the team team together. Well, we've we've got time for one more question. Can I just just comment yeah. on the cloud point? Um, I think um, one of the things that I've found in financial services, responding to Stephen's point about you know financial services not picking up cloud uh, issues and and adopting of cloud, I think um, one thing I found is about having good success stories about this and like low latency trading on cloud, for example. There are very few success stories on that, as an example, right? So I think I'm sure that if, if more and more um, organizations, possibly some fintechs, others start to adopt it, hedge funds start to adopt it, perhaps larger investment banks, exchanges, et cetera, start to then adopt that. Um, resiliency is still a point that remains. I was having a conversation, like we have a cloud first strategy, but that doesn't mean that you know we, we let the on-prem go. Uh, where it makes sense, absolutely, uh, cloud is first. Uh, problem is that, you know, for example, when we're talking about mean time to recover, how do you access certain log files? You know, if it's on-prem, your support team has got access to that straight away. You know, you, they can go and do it. Now, how quickly can you, you know, get a ticket raised and get those access to those log files on an AWS? I don't know. It's like those sort of things still makes people feel a bit nervous. I'm sure these are, can all be resolved, but it's it's about that. Thanks, Ubi. Um, we've got time for one more question. We've got several. Um, and I apologize to anybody whose question isn't going to get answered, but somebody does want to um, to hear the panel's views on the management of um, risk associated with open source technologies. And I think there's, there's a lot of talk about this, and I, 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 this isn't in the question, but I assume it partly relates to the management of licenses, for example. Uh, and maybe I can ask you about this first, because I know that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that JP Morgan has been, uh, I don't know, a doctor of open source uh, tooling. Um, can you talk, tell us a little bit about, again, in, in, in the context of, of, of um, uh, uh, interfacing uh, software development and quality assurance with the enterprise change management strategies, um, mm. will fit with that? Is it, is it simple? Actually, no. It's uh, one of the more complex topics. Um, and um, while we are not so much concerned with the licenses because usually the open source open source software follows a set of licenses and we also have a policy in the firm to accept a certain set of licenses um, with the software it's more about the vulnerability the security risk that comes along with the open source software we rely on um, we do have a tool a vendor software that we scan our software every single time on every single build um, discovering the vulnerabilities. Uh, we actually replaced that software literally, literally last month with something semi-built in-house, semi-built outside that gives much better, I, I would say ma many fewer false positives and much, much better accuracy. Um, but all in all, one of the reasons that we strongly contemplate about moving to GitHub rather than the internal source code management is one of these reasons is this because the GitHub offers great management and scans of the open source software vulnerabilities. So yeah, it's okay. not an easy topic. Okay, yeah. Well, that's that's a that's a, that's a new topic for me. Thank you for that answer. I mean, Rich, do you have anything to add to that? I'm sorry, I don't really know. You know, nationwide um, um, use of, of open source tooling is. So it feels much the same. I think the, the use of open source going forward is inevitable, and, and therefore you know we're we're trying to embrace it. Um, obviously, with the the, the caution of the security aspect as well. So um, uh, we we're actually trying to adopt um, uh, a, a community um, uh, native framework at the moment, um, which is I, I guess a, a kind of a, med, a midway uh, solution to that, and and, and really getting uh teams to contribute um assets that we, that we know are safe towards a, a a a community framework so so that's that's the kind of the the curveball in terms of open source that we're going down 
Okay, thank you. Um, um, I, I would I would say uh, there's a few things. Obviously, more, if not every company, is using open source in some way, shape, or form. And one of the things that you want to make sure is you use, I guess, the popular open source, not the random open source that you find. You want to make sure that you are looking at and using open source software that has been scanned. There are third parties, there are public parties that are constantly scanning these open source software, making sure that at least there is some level of security or uh, I guess feeling of security in the software that you are using. And as Anne said, and as Rich said, you wanna make sure that you are constantly scanning and constantly making sure that your open source is updated. You don't just wanna grab open source and leave it and ignore it. So you have to make sure that as vulnerabilities are found that you are keeping that in mind. And so you want to have software that is constantly looking and making sure that your software in the open source community is up to date. But you don't just want to grab any open source that you find and use that. You want to make sure that you are reputable and open source software that is being maintained. That is another key. You want to make sure that you're using open source that's being maintained, not stale old open source. Absolutely. Any, any, any final contribution on that topic? No, no, I agree that, you know, open source is definitely, uh, you know, something that, you know, needs to be looked at. And, you know, the only way to kind of reduce the risk is to do more scanning. So, yeah, I agree with the panel. Well, look, uh, thanks to our, to our, to, to our panel today. We, we run out of time. Thank you for joining us. You can go back to your timeline and go to our virtual exhibition and, um, and uh, check to Broadcom there and download uh, white papers and um, other technical content. Um, do give that a try. Just go back to your timeline. Um, I'd like to thank Sudeep, Sudeep from the Online Stock Exchange Group, Sudeep Chachi, okay. from JP Morgan, uh, Richard Jordan taking part, and Stephen Polony from Broadcom. Um, our, um, our next um, uh, um, session in this series of the 2021 billion is on January the uh, 10th, I believe, uh, um, the 13th. It's on the 13th. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, which will be uh, focusing on on uh, priority mobile uh, development, so that that'll be an interesting one. Thank you very much for joining us. And if you did join late, uh, the recording of this entire seminar will be available online at the website uh, shortly. Thank you, and have a good uh, good day, good evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you.